Welcome to the second season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Every episode is free on our website at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. To support Murder in 20, please like and share, and feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them, we're not shy. And we couldn't do this podcast without all our sources, which we acknowledge throughout the podcast and are listed on our website. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. In Fort Worth, Texas, Jack and Paula Coslow adopted a little girl, Christiane, born on Valentine's Day in 1975. But the union didn't last, and by age seven, Christy's parents divorced. Paula became a single parent, raising Christy alone, along with their two dogs, in their moderately sized home. Jack, who'd been a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, became a bank executive and met Karen, a colleague who also worked at the bank. She was a lifelong resident of Fort Worth and was from a prominent Texas family, with money and ties to the oil industry. The Odessa American reported that she was active in the ballet, modern art museum, and the local garden club, and served many charities. The couple married and moved into a stately two-story light brick home in Rivercrest, an exclusive neighborhood with mansions and manicured lawns, belonging to the city's oldest and wealthiest families. Christy became bitter about her parents' divorce, as child support issues were dragged through the courts for years. She lashed out at her mother, often flying into a rage if she was asked to do something, and she ran away from home several times. By age 13, her relationship with her father had deteriorated to non-existent. She felt that Karen had tried to take her mother's place, and that both her father and Karen were snobs that looked down on her and her friends. Christy had an IQ of 125 to 130, which is considered above average. She wasn't one to apply herself in school. Her father felt she lacked ambition, was self-centered, and associated with the wrong people, including drug dealers. Christy attended public high school for a while, while there, she approached a couple of classmates and offered to pay them to kill her father and stepmother. They thought she must be joking and turned her down. And just to be safe, they distanced themselves from her. Then her stepmother Karen tried to help by enrolling Christy in a three-month psychiatric program for emotionally disturbed teenagers. Again, she told fellow students she wanted Jack and Karen dead and they too thought she couldn't be serious. Jeffrey Dillingham lived with his parents. His father was an engineering chief at a local company. Jeff was the opposite of Christie in school. He was a member of the National Honor Society and held a full-time job at a video store while still in high school. He and his longtime girlfriend had even set a wedding date and he had plans to register for advanced auto mechanics at college. Jeff met Brian Salter when the two attended Brewer High School. In January 1991, Brian broke into a vehicle and stole numerous items, which he then sold at a pawn shop. He was arrested on charges of burglarizing. Later that year in November, Brian and Christy began dating. Almost immediately, she began telling him how much she hated her father and stepmother and that she wished they were dead. Brian shared with her that he had considered killing his own parents, and Christy responded by saying 
Maybe in a couple of years, they could kill hers too. The young couple seemed to have a lot in common, and by Christmas were engaged, and Brian moved in with Christy and her mum. In the meantime, Christy was talking about arranging a burglary at her father and Karen's home, and that she wanted her stepmother's clothes. In January 1992, she reached out to her father and pretended to be friendly so that she could stop by the house. But what Jack didn't know is that his 17-year-old daughter's contempt for him and his wife had intensified to the point that she wanted them dead. Christy estimated that with both of them gone, she would inherit around $15 million. She escalated her plan from burglary to murder for hire and asked Brian to talk to Jeff about carrying it out. She offered them each 500000 to a million dollars. The money was too good for the 19-year-olds to resist, and they began to plot the couple's demise. In early March, Brian drove Christy over to her father's and sat in the car and watched as she walked up to her father in the yard and gave him a kiss. Brian and Jeff threw ideas around. Jeff suggested poisoning them, or blowing up their car, or making it look like a murder-suicide. And they talked about using the money they'd get to start a business. Christy and Brian cruised car lots and picked out the vehicles they would buy with her inheritance. She picked out a red BMW 325i, and he a Toyota Land Cruiser. They also cruised the surrounding wealthy neighborhoods, picking out houses. Brian and Jeff were going back and forth, trying to decide if they should carry out Christie's plan. For weeks, the threesome lit up the phone lines. Christie made it clear that both Jack and Karen needed to be dead for her to inherit the money. Otherwise, the money would go to one of them. Eventually, Christy told Brian to get it done, or forget about it. She drew them a three-page map of her father and Karen's 4,000-square-foot home. She told them there should be a few thousand dollars in cash in the house, and listed the items they could steal and where to find them, and she gave them the code to disarm the alarm. She instructed them to do it quietly and to make it as painless as possible. The Longview News Journal reported that Brian and Jeff had made plans four or five times to kill Christie's parents, but Brian got nervous and cancelled it each time. On March 10th, Brian and Jeff were considering permanently cancelling the murder and instead just robbing the couple. But they didn't tell Christie about their change of plans. They would tell her afterwards that something happened and it didn't go as planned. The next night, Brian called Christy to tell her this was a day. That evening, she was with him as he drove to his father's house. While his parents were attending church, he took a three twenty caliber automatic pistol and a short-barreled thirty eight caliber revolver. Meanwhile, Jack and Karen were enjoying dinner at an Italian restaurant and headed home around 10 p.m., Upstairs, they locked their bedroom door, set the alarm system, and retired to bed. Christy stayed home while their plan was set into motion. Just before midnight, Brian called her to tell her he and Jeff were leaving to carry it out. She told him to be careful. He then met up with Jeff, carrying the stolen pistols and extra ammunition. They also took a pry bar two knives, and a backpack containing glass cutters and latex gloves. At the back fence of the Coslows, they hesitated for almost half an hour. Jeff was having second thoughts and asked Brian, Are you sure you want to do this? Then Jeff hopped over the fence and Brian followed. They spent 20 minutes trying to pry open the back door. It wasn't budging. So they stepped back and took a run at it, 
hitting it hard. Brian deactivated the alarm as Jeff ran upstairs. Karen woke up first. Jack woke up to her yelling, They're in the house. They could hear voices downstairs. Then the intruders yelled, We've got guns, and this is a robbery. Jack could see a light flashing on the alarm panel that a door had been opened, but then the alarm had been turned off. Karen was still lying in bed when Jack reached into the closet and grabbed his shotgun and was attempting to load it when Jeff kicked the door in. The room was dark. Jeff shone a flashlight in their eyes. Brian arrived just as Jeff ordered the couple to lie on the floor at the foot of the bed. Karen was terrified. Jack told her to come over to him and lay down and to trust him, and she did. They could hear the men discussing where to cut them and how to kill them. Jeff began to beat them with the pry bar. First he hit Jack on the back of the head. Then he hit Karen. Then back to Jack. Karen was screaming, so he swung at her again. But the couple did not pass out after one or two blows like he expected. He kept swinging the pry bar, and Karen kept screaming. Jeff swung the pry bar at her neck, hitting her throat and crushing her larynx. Karen stopped resisting, lay down, and went quiet. As Jeff continued the beating, Brian looked in the closet where Christy had told him the money would be. There was no money, not the thousands she had promised. He found Jack's gold watch and wallet with a hundred and twenty bucks. Brian kept looking and in a drawer found a knife and offered it to Jeff. He refused, saying that he wasn't going to do it. So Brian walked over and stood over Karen. He lifted her chin and sliced her throat from left to right. Then he leaned over Jack and did it again. The attack was violent. Blood splattered on all four walls and the mirror cabinet doors. Dripping blood coated the room. Jack was a fighter. When the beating started, everything went black and he saw stars. But he somehow managed to stand up and, driven by adrenaline, went after Jeff. Brian was startled to see Jack standing. Jeff used a pry bar to beat Jack numerous times until his body slumped back to the floor. Brian was holding one of the guns he'd brought when it went off in his hand. The loud gunshot scared them. Christy had told them to keep it quiet, and now they might have woken a neighbor. They knew they had to get out of there fast. They quickly looked around for the cause of those car keys, and when they couldn't find them, they ran. At 4 a.m., Brian called Christy to tell her it was done. But he lied and told her that Jeff had been the one to do it while he waited outside. She asked them if they were both dead, and he replied, he wasn't sure, but he hoped so. 48-year-old Jack laid there for three hours, unconscious. When he came to at 3.40 a.m., he saw his wife laying face down on the floor in a massive pool of blood. He knelt beside her. He tried to lift her. Her body felt cold, and he realized she might be dying. A cold feeling and a sense of rage came over him. He propelled himself to walk downstairs and out the door and across the street to a neighbor's house. When she opened the door, she discovered Jack in his boxer shorts covered in blood. He collapsed on her floor and said that he and his wife had been attacked and that they had been beaten and stabbed and that somebody needed to get to his wife. 
Police arrived to find Karen on the floor beside the bed, dead at 40. On the bed lay the empty shotgun. On the floor were unspent shotgun shells and a bloody knife. The bullet fired for Bynes' pistol was found on the first floor. A uniformed officer was placed outside Jack's hospital room. Police would say it was done as a courtesy as the family had concerns that the two suspects may return. But what police didn't tell the public is that they strongly suspected Jack of killing his wife. He told them that the alarm had been deactivated and they wondered if he had done it. And if there had been intruders, why had they let him live? And why didn't he call 911 from his own house? When interviewing Jack, they read him his Miranda rights. Jack lost a third of his blood. His skull had an open fracture that doctors worried may lead to a brain infection. Had the slice to his neck gone any deeper, it would have severed a major artery and led to death. Jack had no idea, but that gun accidentally going off saved his life. Later that morning, Christy asked Brian if her father had seen him, and he replied no. She told him not to worry then. He wouldn't get caught. The couple went to the hospital. Christy told reporters that her father said, He was glad she came. That night, Jeff contacted his best friend, Paul Carrillo, and told him he had killed someone. He asked him to get rid of the bloody pry bar and blood-soaked clothes. A few days later, reporters were staked outside her father's home when Christy decided to give an interview to keep suspicion away from her. She said that her and Karen were as close as a stepdaughter and stepmother could be. And later, when Brian told her that she should be an actress, Christy just laughed. Karen's autopsy revealed that she had been struck at least 27 times and had defensive wounds. She died of a crushed larynx. After the blow from the pry bar, she didn't die immediately. She was alive for another 10 to 20 minutes, but she was already dead when her throat was slashed. And based on the contents of her stomach, she died within a couple hours of leaving the restaurant, which narrowed the time down to around midnight, not 3.40 a.m. as police originally thought. Once police realized that Jack was a victim and not a suspect, they began to look at others close to the couple. They had heard that Karen and Christy were not on good terms, and Christy was considered a suspect, although they had no evidence. On Monday, March 16th, Jack left the hospital briefly to attend Karen's funeral. Afterwards, at her graveside service, he said a prayer and placed a flower on his wife's casket. Paul knew that he needed to turn over the evidence that Jeff had given him to the police. He waited 12 days before he contacted them. He phoned them and said he had some things they needed to look at. Detectives responded immediately. At 12.30 a.m., police swooped in and arrested Jeff as he was leaving his job at the video store. Jeff then told police about Brian and Christy. Police staked out Christy's mom's house. Just after 7 a.m., Christy and Brian left in her white Ford Escort. When they stopped at a traffic sign, police vehicles pulled in front and behind them, and both were arrested. Police carried out search warrants. At Brian's parents' home, they confiscated guns and ammunition, including a three twenty six caliber pistol. At Christie's home, they found three pairs of men's shoes, a pair of white socks, and Jack's wallet. Evidence was also seized from Brian's car that was parked in the driveway. After their arrests, a neighbor of the Coslows told the Fort Worth Star-Telegram that these houses 
don't protect you from family tragedy. They don't protect you from money problems. It didn't protect Karen. All three teenagers were interviewed by homicide detectives. They were advised of their rights. Not one of them asked for a lawyer. Bail was set at 500000 each. In Texas, a charge of capital murder is filed when someone either offers or accepts money to commit a murder, and the charge automatically carries either a death sentence or life in prison. Four days later, they were each arraigned on conspiracy and attempted capital murder charges and held in the county jail. Their bail was each raised to one million. Christy appeared briefly in court. Her long dark hair hung straight down. She stood in white socks and flip-flops, her plump figure draped in a jail-issued light blue smock. In April, a grand jury indicted Christy, Brian, and Jeff on capital murder and attempted capital murder charges. In August 1993, Jeff was the first to go to trial. He was offered a plea deal to testify against Christy and Brian, but turned it down. In the chief prosecutor's closing summary, he called Jeff a butcher with a heart filled with a nest of scorpions. Jeff was found guilty and sentenced to death. Brian accepted a plea deal in exchange for testifying against Christy and received a life sentence. At Christie's trial in June 1994, it took the jury just over three hours to find her guilty. She also received a life sentence. Jack was asked if his adopted daughter deserved the death penalty, and he responded yes. That's what she gave Karen. Jeff filed many appeals, and all were denied. On November 1, 2000, Eight and a half years after he murdered Karen, he was executed by lethal injection. The first parole date for both Christy and Brian is March 2027. Karen did not leave Christy a penny in her will. She did leave Jack her share of the house and $500,000 in a trust. But in a twist, to ensure Christy couldn't touch it, she made a stipulation that Jack couldn't withdraw from it until after Christy turned 18. Jack has remarried, but to this day carries a scar around his neck that reminds him of the scar on his heart. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Kelsey Barath. She loved being a new mom, but her ex-boyfriend wanted their daughter all to himself. He arranged for his girlfriend to murder Kelsey, and when she couldn't, he did. A deal was made with the devil to get justice for Kelsey. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And every week, we announce upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. Until then, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.